Welcome to season five of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our goal with this podcast is to bring scientific evidence and experience to shed light on critical health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, I speak with Dr. Gigi Granval about the public health consequences of Russia's disinformation that the U.S. and Ukraine were working on bioweapons in labs across Ukraine. We also discuss Russia's deadly 1979 bioweapons accident and why biosecure labs are critically important to public health. Let's listen. Gigi Granval, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. So today we're going to talk about the public health consequences of Russia's disinformation about Ukrainian labs. So the Russian government has claimed that the U.S. and Ukraine were working on bioweapons in labs across Ukraine. And this is really dangerous. And part of what makes it so dangerous is that there actually are these critical biosecure labs in Ukraine. So tell us about these labs and where they came from and what they actually do. Sure. So there are labs like anywhere. There are labs that do public health work, diagnostic work in Ukraine and other places. And when, uh, let me first start talk about the Russian accusations. So when they first made these accusations, it was horrifying because they have had a history of accusing others of something that they plan to do themselves. So that was immediately horrifying just on the face of it that saying that that Ukraine had a biological weapons program, that raises the concern that Russia would use biological weapons and then accuse Ukraine of doing that. And then that would give them the excuse to escalate what weapons they would use. Because Russia does indeed have a biological weapons program, which they should not have because it's against international law and they've signed treaties that say that they should not have one. But there are labs that have had U.S. support in Ukraine, and that is the germ that Russia took to blow up into this disinformation campaign. And so way back when the Soviet Union first fell apart, it became clear that there were biological weapons programs in the former Soviet Union, and there were all kinds of illegal weapons programs in the former Soviet Union. And there was a big effort to try and demilitarize those programs and to retrain people and basically reduce threats. And that is where the Biological Threat Reduction Program came from. And it's long ago now, so those scientists are not around, those programs are not around, but the U.S. Has, and other countries have benefited from having public health support. In, and uh, so diseases get reported to the World Health Organization. They get help to learn about new biosafety techniques to make their work safer. So it's it's been a, a win-win and, and, and it's a program that is, it's very successful and a good thing for the world, which is of course um, why Russia wants to make it a bad thing. And so what kinds of threats might you find in one of these labs in Ukraine? They have uh, m- normal public health work going on in these labs. And so the, the pathogens that they have are reflective of the kinds of disease threats that are ongoing in Ukraine. So there are labs that focus on agricultural threats. So African swine fever is something that has been studied a lot in these Ukrainian labs because it's a big problem. It it doesn't affect humans, but it's a big problem if you have a pork industry. And so there's that. There's other diseases that are endemic in the area include Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever or CCHF. That's another one that's that's really big deal in Ukraine and in the region. They also have COVID. And so there's a lot of uh, COVID work going on the, in the Ukrainian labs to diagnose people. And what's interesting is that Russia actually had a deadly bioweapons anthrax accident back in 1979. And when we first talked about this episode, I called it a lab leak and you corrected me on that terminology. So tell us about that incident and why my terminology was incorrect. 
Sure. So I said that Russia had a a biological weapons program and they have had one when they were Russia and before when they were the Soviet Union. And back in the Soviet days in, in 1979, they had this anthrax manufacturing facility. So they were making anthrax spores by the ton to be loaded into bombs. And so there was some sort of explosion that occurred in this uh, facility in Sverdlovsk. And a lot of anthrax went into the air. People died. And then the anthrax uh, ended up contaminating fields. And so the cattle ate it. They got contaminated. People ate the cattle. They ate the beef. And then they got anthrax that way too. So it's, it was a big multifaceted disaster, but it's not really a lab leak because it wasn't really a lab. It was really a, like a production plant. And the fact that it was illegal and clandestine adds to the, you know, it, they shouldn't have been doing it anyway, but it's like, it would be like calling like a meth lab, you know, explosion, like a chemistry lab accident. So it's not, it's, yes, it's, it was, chem, it would be chemistry that would blow up the lab, but they shouldn't have been doing it anyway. <laughs> And and they really went to extremes to try and cover that up, right? They did. They said that it was a contaminated meat. They said it was natural occurrence. They managed to convince some scientists in the U.S. that it was uh, natural as well. But this was not unknown to the intelligence world, even at the time. The declassified National Security Archives from the incident report that, you know, General so-and-so visited the site after the explosion. They counted the number of cars that were blocking off the road. So they knew that something was up and they theorized that it was some sort of biological weapons facility accident. And that point right there is actually important for breaking down some COVID-19 misinformation and disinformation. So can you explain that link there? Yeah, I mean, I think people assume that, uh, I mean, there's a scientific story and then there's the things that you know from looking at it. And if we had had access to all the science of what happened in Sverdlovsk, it became clear when we got more detail that it was a plume that people got sick from it. And plus we had the intelligence observations that made it clear that something was amiss. I think people try and take the lesson that try and apply these kinds of things to COVID, but all the science scientific evidence that we have so far, and we have quite a bit points to a market emergence. And if there was cover up, it was cover up that you know, that they had these contraband animals in the market that could spread disease. So that's probably another kind of episode uh, for for a future time to talk about why scientists believe strongly that COVID came from a natural source. And but it's uh, it's hard to compare across time. Sure. Um, And we've talked a lot on this podcast about the costs of mis and disinformation. And in this particular case, as you know, for this episode, Russia's using this disinformation as sort of, it's being used to justify their invasion. But what are the other dangers of this kind of mis- and disinformation? Yes, I worry a lot that they're conflating any sort of biological research with nefarious activity. And I think that that is something that has been picked up um, not only in that region, but in circles here in the U.S., and I think, you know, it's it's very dangerous because these labs are so important. Uh, we, we want them to be working to diagnose people's disease. <laughs> we want them to be coming up with new treatments. And so I worry that people will just say, oh, well, biology, you know, yuck, that's only for bad things. And that's not true because without this kind of work, without surveillance, we would be in even a worse situation with COVID than we are now. And I worry about the future. So I, I hope that people push back on that disinformation. Russia has chosen to not really invest in their own life sciences research. And I think it's to their detriment. They will have future problems because of that. And I would hate to see that happen to the U.S. as well. And going back to what you were talking about before, about these labs in the Ukraine that are doing this really, really important work, none of them, even during the Soviet Union, ever had biological weapons. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And they certainly, you know, the biological weapons programs there are, obviously Russia has has a biological weapons program that they developed for weapons. 
but Ukraine does not. The U.S. does not. There is a treaty, the Biological Weapons Convention, and it is the the first treaty that took an entire class of weapons off the table. And it's still around, and we still want to keep it that way. There's no use of biological weapons. And so what should people take from all of this? I'm hoping that the situation in Ukraine is one of disinformation only, um, which I think is bad enough, but it's certainly much more preferable to actual use of biological weapons. So I, I hope that it stays there. If Russia decides to use chemical or biological weapons, and I think chemicals is more likely, it's going to require some sort of response because the, the world has decided that this, these are not acceptable weapons to use. Well, we hope that it certainly does not come to that. But thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker, Matthew Martin, Spencer Greer, and Holly Cardinal, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez. Thank you for listening.